Hello, this is Abbott Austin for another edition of Talk Lexio, where we do Lexio Divina on a biblical passage. And um, I am not at my abbey, St. Procopius Abbey, but I'm actually at meetings at St. Joseph Abbey in Covington, Louisiana. So that's why I have a different background. Um, we want to do Lexio Divina this time on what will be this Sunday's um, second reading, which is from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. Um, one thing to say quickly before we get into the reading itself is that one of the questions that comes up in Lexi Divina, of course, is uh, how do I choose a biblical passage? And then also, how long should it be? So usually it, it's pretty short. It doesn't have to be very long. You just want to think about that passage closely and reflect on uh, what is God saying through the human author in this passage. So um, sometimes, though, it does help to take a larger section. And, and I would say uh, this is one where you could look at the larger uh, chapter, chapter 15, uh, I'm just going to read a part of it, um, but you could look at the larger chapter, and that can be helpful, and you could do Lexio by reading a longer passage as well. So in this case, this might be one time that would be helpful to do. Uh, in any case, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to understand your scriptures through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first step in Lexio Divina, of course, is to simply read the passage, but read it attentively, uh, listen. Um, it helps to read it more than once, and I will put the uh, passage in the description so you can read it there. Um, but read it with faith, too. That this is God speaking to you, and what is he speaking to you, to us? So here it is, uh, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. It is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual is not first, rather the natural is and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, earthly, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly one, so also are the earthly, and as is the heavenly one, so also are the heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly one, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. So um, this is, a again, it can help to read the longer passage here, the all of chapter 15, and um, I did that, I looked at it, and a couple of things to help put it in context here is that Jesus, um, excuse me, St. Paul uh, starts uh, by saying what he's handed on as of first importance in his proclamation of the gospel. And, and he said this Christ died uh, for our sins and according to the scriptures, that he rose again according to the scriptures, and he appeared to the apostles. Okay, so then Paul then starts talking about um, there's apparently people in the Corinthian community who are denying the resurrection of the body. Right? It's so central to our Catholic um uh, or in a Christian view, that Jesus rose from the dead in his body. He's alive in the body now. So um, some people are denying this. And then throughout church history, this happens. People, it's kind of odd because it's so central, but they deny this. Christians deny this, right? Um, so St. Paul's making this point, like, this is central. You can't deny this. And if you do, it has all these horrible um, consequences that we don't want to hold, right? Uh, it denies that the, um, our faith is in vain, or still in our sins. He says stuff like that. And then he starts in chapter 15, uh, after that, he, he starts going through kind of explanations by analogy of uh, how to think about this, right? Apparently people are having problems, like, well, how can we have a, a body that like lasts forever? The body is just subject to change, decay, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so he starts talking about different, there's different kinds of bodies, things, talks about analogies of a seed being sown and then and growing into something else. Uh, so our body starts out one way, but then it becomes something new and it's transformed uh, into in eternal life. And he takes it up, um, he goes through all the different points um, that are worth looking at, and then he gets to this uh, passage I just read. So a few things to notice here. So again, um, as we do this second step of meditation and think about it, we, we need to have a, a starting point, something to get us thinking and pondering the text and asking questions about it, going deeper and so forth. So a um, couple things are in this passage are interesting. Uh, one is simply that you have Adam, who's referred to as the first man, Adam, and then there's the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ. So um, it's a very rich thought, uh, right, that Adam starts the human race, but then Jesus is the second Adam in a way that restarts uh, the human race, right? There's a new beginning here, a new creation, a new beginning of the human race uh, in the new Adam, the last Adam, which is uh, Jesus Christ, right? It's a rich idea in itself. Some other things to think about in this passage are uh, 
the translation, it's hard. It's a really hard uh, thing to translate into English, this passage, because one thing, uh, it says the first man, Adam, became a living being. It's literally became a living soul. Um, suke is the uh, where we get the word psyche from, um, is the Greek there. And so that is a, um, that's the word for soul. And, you know, people debate, you know, is it the same thing we mean by soul and all that, but that's what's literally there. All right. So the first Adam's a living soul, has a body that is in soul, right? And then the last Adam, Christ, becomes a life-giving spirit, okay? And then it goes on, and this is hard to translate too. And it's not that the translation is bad, it's just really hard to put into English, the nuances here. But then St. Paul says, but the spiritual was not first, rather the natural and then the spiritual. So we have a natural body and then a spiritual body, okay? Okay, the word for natural there is is referring to the soul again. Um, and it, we don't have a good word for this. So again, the, um, the suke is this Greek word for soul, and then we get psyche from that. And so if, we don't have an adjective for soul, really, right? So we would have to say psychic, but that means something weird uh, or different uh, for you know, what we're getting at. It's, it's not what, uh, what that means for us today is different. So um, yeah, so it's, it's like soulish, um, right? So the first... Uh, Man was soulish, and the second, which doesn't really mean the same thing with Paul's getting at either, but then the uh, second man, Adam, was heavenly um, and spiritual, so with that. So, all right, how do we think about this? Well, it, for one, we might not get to the end of it, but it is interesting to think about. And so one thing is to think about distinctions between body, soul, and spirit in the ancient world. And in St. Paul, he does use this language in some of his writings, right? So what does it mean to... a uh, have a lot, you know, we have all three, right? Body, soul, spirit. Okay, but to have a life, the life in this earth, on this earth, is the life um, that's especially characterized by the soul, characterized by the soul. The next life will be especially characterized by the spirit. It's not to deny that in this life, as well as the next life, we'll have body, soul, and spirit. But um, there's something about that, that there's something about the spiritual that comes into prominence in a way that it's not prominent in this life. It's going to come into a prominence in a new life. This is one way of thinking about it. So, um, and in this case, you can think of the spirit is as um, that capacity within us um, to be aware of the eternal, to be aware of God, the things of God, to be open to the life of God, right? We as human beings have this. So we have, um, we have a soul and a soul makes, a, you know, and souls the body and gives us life and becomes sentient. We're aware of the world around us and all that's, uh, you know, important, of course. But when they talk about the spirit, uh, it's opening up to the eternal. So in this life, our existence is characterized especially by that awareness of the world around us. And we do have a spirit that is open to the things of God and to God. Um, but in the next life, we're going to be so open uh, to God. We're going to see God face to face. That, that kind of then, uh, some saints speak about it, flows. That the richness of seeing God flows into the rest of our being, into our soul, into our bodies even. So that we have, as St. Paul says, in the, the larger chapter 15, uh, a spiritual body, right? It's still a body, it's still bodily, but it's spiritual in a way. It's, it's taken up into this openness to God and uh, sharing the very life of God to the fullest extent we can as human beings, right? So it's, there's a richness here. So St. Paul is trying to say, look, the way we, our existence now is gonna be transformed in this radical way in the life to come. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, and it's a lot you can do with this. Again, if you never get to the end of it or figure it out with certainty what St. Paul is getting at, that's fine. But still thinking about these things in the light of God uh, with faith uh, can be a helpful a meditation and helpful. So then we move to uh, the third step of Lexi Divina, which is to offer a prayer from a meditation and a prayer that is asking God for something. So I'll offer such a prayer now. Lord, I ask that you strengthen my hope for the resurrection that you put within me a longing and a looking forward to a spiritual life, a life fully um, enjoying and taking part in your life and all that that will mean. It's uh, that's beyond my current understanding, but give me a hope for that, longing for that greatness that you're calling us to. He asks us through Christ our Lord. Amen. And then the final fourth step of Lex Divina is to rest in the presence of God, um, you know, by meditating on scripture and then Praying from it should bring us into uh, cl closer to God. And so we now rest in that. So let's just uh, observe a few moments of contemplative rest.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining me for Lexio Divina, this talk Lexio. And um, pray for us here at St. Joseph, but also my Abbey, St. Procopius. God bless you.